Why is dating so gosh darn difficult today? Not only finding the right person, but once you're finally in a relationship, is it just me or these things, I don't know, just seem to be escalating in terms of the tension, communication difficulties, mental health issues when it comes to dating and relationships, the role that anxiety, trauma, personality disorders play in a dating relationship. How do you know when a relationship is healthy? How do you know when it's worth throwing in the towel? Or if I should just stick this out a little bit longer because you know there's a, there's a sunrise coming if I just push it a little harder and make this work out. How do you discern these things? Well, uh, today we've got, it, don't, it would be nice if there's like a doctor of love. Well, today we kind of have one. Uh, we've got a, uh, a doctor who specializes in helping dating couples, married couples, uh, navigate their path towards discernment of marriage uh, and realizing, yeah, it's going to be a struggle. John Paul II said, love is a constant challenge thrown to us by God. And so we're going to work over the next half hour about how to navigate through these struggles, especially as they pertain to mental health and dating or marriage relationships. Now, before we dive in, though, uh, we are into Lent. And so if you've ever gotten to Easter Sunday and been like, Eh, I did kind of a lame Lent. I mean, I could have done that a little harder, you know, or maybe it's Ash Thursday and you're like, I already blew Lent. It's like one day in and I already messed up half my stuff. Sometimes it helps to have kind of a, a guideline, a path of what we should do. And for guys, the awesome team over at Exodus 90 has created something where it's a website called Lent for men.com. And it's a 40 day journey where you're going to accompany them meditating on the gospel of Mark. Uh, and so if you go to Lent for men.com slash Jason, you can sign up for this thing. And it's just a, I, I guarantee you do this thing. Easter comes and you're gonna be like, that was a good Lent. I got as, I think as much out of that Lent as possible. And so give this thing a shot, lentformen.com slash Jason. And then also wanna thank another sponsor of Lust is Boring, which is the new Canopy app. If you're a parent or just looking to stay good online, a lot of the filter stuff out there can block porn websites, which is kind of like the easy thing to do in terms of software. The difficult thing is, what do you do with immodest imagery that's showing up on non-pornographic websites on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, thankfully, they've got the artificial intelligence that will be able to scan the page, delete the image before it even shows up in milliseconds. And so if you go to canopy.us uh, slash Jason, you can try this stuff for free for 30 days. Just use the promo code 15 off, and then you get 15% off for lifetime, but you get to try it for a month for free. So if you're a parent or not, check this thing out. You can install it on your kids' phones, laptops, or whatever to keep the whole family safe online. Now, Today's topic, uh, we've got Dr. Dr. Mario Sacasa. He is an associate director of the Faith and Marriage Apostolate of the Will Woods community. He's got a PhD, uh, licensed marriage and family therapist, and also hosts a podcast known as the Always Hope Podcast. So Dr. Mario, thank you for coming on the Lust is Boring podcast today. Thanks, man. I appreciate the invitation to be here with you, Jason. I'm going to have a great time. Yeah, no, I'm looking forward to having you on there. I'm familiar with uh, Jason Angelette and the good work he's yeah. done with you guys down there. Incredible yeah. gentleman. Yeah, he's he's just a gem of a person, man. I just what a gift to work with him every day. And uh, yeah, dude, Jason's awesome. So can't say can't say enough about it. We could talk about yeah. 30 minutes about Jason, his story, but uh, yeah, but we should probably stay on topic. We but should yeah, stay maybe on topic, I'll I have him on another day. Incredible <laughs> man, though, like you said. Um, now, how how did you get? knowing that this is your calling in life, that God was calling you to use these gifts to help couples and whether it's married couples, dating couples, why, why are you even passionate about this subject to begin with? Yeah. So we can go way back to being an undergraduate and uh, taking organic chemistry. And I was a biology major moving in that direction of being a doctor. And I got to organic chemistry and, and realized this stinks and I can't do this. And <laughs> yeah. I got like a nine or something and barely yeah. failed the class anyways we could yeah. we could talk about organic another time also but i had my quarter life crisis at 20 and said lord i don't want to be a doctor anymore because i can't do this what mm -hmm. am i supposed to do i took a psychology class that summer and uh like fish to water man i just loved it yeah. and i was like this is it this is what i want to do and so mm -hmm. pursued that and then towards my senior year i started discovering the theology of the body and and that uh, information was starting to kind of come around in the early 2000s mm -hmm. and it just felt like a beautiful marriage you know between the two yeah. between being able to work with couples and and understand the church's perspective of, of of marriage and of relationships and what that vision is and to be able to integrate that with the sound you know marital counseling practices and what the research says about what works for couples and what doesn't work for couples and it just made a lot of sense to me you know and as I went and got my master's degree and, and pursued further education on that 
it's just always kind of been the, the, the call that I feel like it's been in my life to be able to bring, bridge these two uh, dimensions together. So, okay. so yeah, so God's basically great. calling you to study chemistry in one form or the other, but you were kind of going down the wrong form of chemistry. <laughs> yeah, different type and, of organic chemistry. That's right. Yeah. It's, 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 uh, it's not a, <laughs> it's not a, I don't even remember all the equations. I, I'm a, it's, it was awful. I'm traumatized for it, but that's, that's all right. That's another yeah. conversation, but yeah, yeah physical no. chemistry, love, that's what we're doing now. So absolutely. You got that oh. right. <laughs> now I've noticed that as mentioned in the intro, you know, I, I've been traveling around for 25 years, speaking high schools, college colleges, young sure. adults, married couples. Um, dating just seems like it's getting harder. I mean, there's all these apps that are supposedly making it easier and, you know, just get on this menu and find the right one for you. But young adults I talk to, it's like, no, this is not making it easier. This is making it more difficult. Um, why would you say that dating just seems more difficult than ever today? Yeah. So I'm, I'm glad you're seeing that also, because I noticed that in my counseling practice over the last 15 years that I've been working with young adults and, and with adults also, just noticing that, man, people are just coming in more and more challenged by by mm -hmm. what the dating scene is. And so I think it's a couple things. I think uh, first and foremost, as you said, you know, these apps try to make things easier, but but they don't. Um, and sometimes we're just overwhelmed by choice. And uh, there's consumer science research that supports this kind of notion of a paradox of choice that if we have too many options, uh, we actually have a harder time making a decision and we walk away feeling more frustrated by the decision that we make. Well, if we have less options, we actually become more confident with the decision that we make. So we see this just with mm. studies on like jam and grocery stores and, and different decisions that we make as consumers. But I think yeah. that that applies also to when it comes to dating, where we think that, well, I got to be on, on five different apps and on Instagram. I got to be open to everything. And we just get overwhelmed with with the options that are before us, that it's too much. And we're yeah. not meant to have that many options before us. So I think one that we're just overwhelmed by choice uh, in general as as a as a default. But I also yeah. think there's something about this this younger generation, the Gen Z kind of late millennials, early Gen Z, whatever way that we're speaking about with young adults and college students now, that there's an overwhelming sense of perfectionism that mm -hmm. tends to ride this group, I think, more than others uh, beforehand. And yeah. and I'm not sure exactly all the reasons for that, but I just something I've I've noted as well. And so I think this increase mm -hmm. of perfectionism, of difficulty of making choice, of fear of making choice, coupled with overwhelming sense of choice, um, yeah. makes a bad recipe for 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 dating. You know, yeah. um, when where we're just supposed to be discerning what God's will is for us, meeting some people, kind of keeping it casual, but uh, yeah. but but we're putting way too much pressure on ourselves, and we're overwhelmed by the amount of options. Um, no. So I think just in general, those are a couple things that come to my mind when we think about what makes it difficult. Yeah. And I think a lot of the singles are probably thinking, I've been thinking all along the problems, me, mm. you know, I'm the reason why dating is so difficult. Mm -hmm. Everybody else must be having a great time because you get on Instagram and she's got the perfect boyfriend, <laughs> the perfect hair, the perfect vacation, the perfect this, you know, and maybe that's what kind of feeds into a lot of this anxiety of needing to be perfect because the images you see of everybody else are perfect. And then meanwhile, while the girls scrolling through Instagram reels of everybody's perfect relationship and their Pinterest family pictures, and they're just feeling like, dang, what's my problem? You know, maybe the guys are looking at all the pornography, where it's this endless possibilities mm -hmm. of options, which really aren't possibilities or options. It's just this idea that this endless availability of women that like, how could you ever settle down on one? And then they end up being 28 years old. And meanwhile, the 28 year old single women are like, Psh, Where's my Prince Charming? And it's like, well, he's sitting on his basement watching porn, you know? And so when these people do finally connect with each other, they're coming into it with a lot of anxiety, perhaps of perfectionism, maybe trauma of what they've been through, uh, like contorted notions of human sexuality. So how have you found the role of whether it be trauma or anxiety to kind of be hindering these relationships once they do find each other? Well, I think I just want to t piggyback on that scenario they just spoke about, even, even just with like the men. Part part of that is that when we have this endless supply of sexual partners, it, it does make it difficult for, for men to make a decision to be decisive because it's always wondering, well, there could always be somebody else or there could always yeah. be somebody else. And I think sometimes even with women, certainly, but we see this, I think, pattern more with men. But but the challenge becomes, you know, is she enough? Well, how do I know if she's enough? Because I have all these other options and I know I can get more options. And, and so making that's when we go back to like kind of that 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 sense of decision making, firm commitment. And where does the distortion come in? Well, the distortion is 
the sense that a there's fantasy out there like you talked about with pornography and then also instagram let's just call it what it is it's all fantasy nobody's being honest you know on mm-hmm. on on those devices and on those platforms um and so we're comparing ourselves to some fantasy that we think exists that doesn't exist um that that's one issue and then the second issue is somehow we just we 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 have forgotten the notion of of making commitments and the importance of making commitments. And somehow we've chided these things and we've made fun of these things and we've said, oh, you know, abundance is what matters. Having options is what makes me secure. Rather than, than firmness and commitment, uh, that those are the things that paradoxically, not paradoxically, those are the things that forced us to grow and to mature when we make a decision on a person and we say that I'm choosing this person to love this person, that mm-hmm. that decision actually is what is best for us. Um, yeah. So when we have endless supply, when we compare ourselves with fantasy, um, we always think that we can just kind of use people. Um, mm-hmm. And I know it's something you talk about often, but it's just it, it's just what it's become. It's become this this callous notion that we can just use people and and object that there's 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 nothing fundamentally different from one person to the next. Um, yeah. And so those things, of course, fly in the face of what we believe that everybody's made unique and unrepeatable. And that discernment of marriage isn't just a discernment of an ideal, but then when you start getting into a serious relationship, discernment becomes something very concrete that I'm no longer discerning this idea of marriage or this fantasy, but I'm, I'm discerning you as a person individually and trying to decipher if, if I'm called to choose you for the rest of my life and you're called to choose me with all my idiosyncrasies and, and brokenness and confusions and personality quirks and all that stuff. Yeah. So so I think when, when, it, when it comes to anxiety specifically, you know, trauma is a whole nother conversation in terms of how trauma impacts us. And, and trauma is distinguished even from adverse childhood relationships, which can be I mean, childhood experiences, which which are general. But but trauma, trauma is its own its own conversation. We all kind of grow up in life and, and grow up with um, certain narratives that we believe about ourselves, whether we've had trauma or not. And those narratives are certainly shaped by our family upbringing in terms of what, where we feel safe and where we don't feel safe. But I think when it comes to anxiety specifically, which we also see is on the rise, all the studies just show anxiety is on the rise, particularly among young women. Um, I think I read something here recently, something like 57% of teenage girls uh, check off feeling, you know, uh, having anxiety or depression to an that it to a point that it's impacting their their capacity to, to work properly. Mm-hmm. That's a sizable number of of, yeah. of people. And so that question, when we say, well, why are people feeling anxious? Well, it's, I mean, we have 50 years of telling people that life is inherently meaningless. What the heck do you think is going to happen? Yeah. Okay, so yeah. let's just call that what it is. And then the second piece, though, just from from a place of modesty and 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 not modesty, a place of tradition, and not having not having kind of the, these guardrails anymore in life that everything is open-ended, everything is a possibility. You could be whatever you want all the time at any point, at any, at any moment. All of that's gonna provoke anxiety because we don't have anywhere that we can kind of land and feel safe and secure in anymore. Whether it's traditional family norms or religion or any of those things that we hold true to and we understand and get as, as men of faith, but the world increasingly is, is losing that. So yeah. I, again, I think there's a lot that goes into this. Um, from cultural issues that that are that are that are narratives that are pressing um, young people and, and it's becoming the waters that they're swimming in for sure um, to just those difficulties as I've been talking about making decisions, having grit and tenacity and resilience to face challenges. I think those are virtues that 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 we're losing as well. And mm-hmm. all of that, of course, comes right into the dating scene where people are coming into this feeling a little bit nervous a little bit unsure and wondering if there's another way of doing this. And the reality is there isn't. It's always going to be awkward. It was always awkward. That's what it is. Yeah. It's just mm-hmm. what it is. But yeah. but we just have to accept that as what it is and push through that and still do the best that we can rather yeah. than judging ourselves and condemning ourselves and expecting shame or I mean, not expecting shame or expecting things to be different than what they are. Um, it's just what it is. And that's yeah, okay. I would imagine in the midst of all this, this difficulty of singles, a lot of people I, I can see as this is your talk. I'm thinking about a lot of people escaping into marriage and a lot of people escaping from marriage, meaning, you know, my parents' relationship was so dysfunctional. I'm not going to go through that. So they're kind of like, forget that, you know, I might hook up or I might have some short-term flings, but I'm going to always keep the other person at an, you know, an arm's distance to uh, avoid getting hurt and vulnerability. But on the other side, people saying, okay, marriage almost becomes this idol of like, once I get in there, then it's all going to be peachy. Then I'm going to have to find the right person for me. And typically both of these approaches land with a lot of disappointment because Mm -hmm. the person who 
idolizes marriage or thinks that it's going to take away all their problems, marriage typically brings your problems to the surface and right in your face with much, much greater, greater clarity than anything else. And then running away from marriage doesn't solve the problem of being protected and, you know, avoiding being hurt. You just are embracing a life of heartbreak and, and resignation and a lack of hope. So for single people who've kind of got a face their demons, you know, what would you say to them in terms of like, Hey, deal with this junk before you go down the aisle, <laughs> instead of expecting marriage to be some kind of car wash. Cause I did lots of talks for engaged couples when I lived in San Diego years ago. And I mean, God bless the couples, but I mean, I would be 15 minutes into the talk and you'd see fiancés crying wow, and mercy. just the body language. And you could Damn. just see like, this is drumming up some heavy stuff that's probably buried underneath you know, the pleasures of a cohabitation or whatever, when you kind of put that aside and really address some of this stuff, it can be scary. And so what would you say to couples, you know, maybe that are dating that maybe do have these issues, or maybe someone who hasn't found the right person yet, but knows, yeah, I got some, I got some mental health issues. What do I do if I'm expecting marriage to solve it? Yeah. Well, I mean, I would agree with you and say that it's not going to solve it. Um, you know, that you do have to, in fact, take time for yourself. And so if, if glimmer of hope here with the research following the COVID-19 pandemic and people kind of locked down, there was this expectation that once, once the, um, at summer of 2020, once kind of people were kind of getting back into things that there was going to be this explosion of kind of hooking up and all this other stuff. And the research just didn't support it. What ended up happening was that young adults took the time to really kind of think about their own lives. And so a lot of them stopped dating for a period of time. And what they ended up finding was this rise in what we would call what the research calls now intentional dating. This is from secular research, not just Catholics yeah. or Christians. This is the country as a whole. This is what we saw is that this rise in intentional dating where young adults were saying, taking this as an opportunity, which we're grateful that people did that and took this opportunity to say, let me reflect on my own life and let me see, like, is this really what I want or what, what is it that I'm really looking for? And again, despite our best efforts as society, the ideals are still present. People still want marriage, still want to be happy. And, and the research supports all of that. But bringing yeah. it back down to the, the context that you're speaking about specifically, that if somebody is single, it, it is a wonderful opportunity to, to ask yourselves, OK, or maybe you've just gotten out of a relationship and to say, well, why didn't that relationship work? What was the, what were things that were present? And be honest with yourself about whether or not some of that could have been the other person, some of that could have been you. Maybe you were too clingy and have to be aware of that or put too much pressure or, or have made marriage this idol that you spoke about. Um, if it becomes an idol, then certainly it's not going to be the thing that's going to satisfy. But conversely, as you stated also, if, if we're just avoiding pain, um, those decisions never really work well for us. If we're just uh, uh, making decisions based on avoidance, um, that almost never works for us. Rather, we have to be clear in terms of what we're seeking and what we're trying to to approach. And so approach motivations rather than avoidance motivations uh, generally work better for us. But again, going back to what are we approaching? What are we seeking? And this is where I think the work that you do is, is so important, you know, is that when we articulate a clear vision uh, for, for marriage, a clear vision for human sexuality that isn't idolizing the relationship, that isn't idolizing marriage, but puts in its proper context as a sacrament, as a vehicle, an efficacious sign of God's grace. If we can see that, not just as this romantic ideal that sometimes we can kind of maybe be overly romantic sometimes in this language, but, but, but that's okay, but just still trying to be clear with what it is and articulating that so that people can choose that on their own. Mm -hmm. And I think that that becomes the healthy way forward. So you can, you can have the, the, the ideal and approach it. But what I see often in this, I see in Catholic circles often is that people maybe have heard the theology of body talks often and or maybe they come away with an overly romantic, overly idealized version of marriage or expectation or all this other stuff. And then and then they start dating somebody. And then it's like, mm, I'm not really feeling all the things that I thought I was supposed to be feeling. But it's like, well, we're, well, which one's real? Like, you got to you got to choose this person that's in front of you. And is, and is this enough? And so, it, again, it always in dating, it's always in the context of the person before you and letting go of maybe of some of those ideals or some of those fantasies that we may have drummed up, um, even if we understand uh, what the church teaches. Um, because you're right, marriage, it's it, it it will force you to grow. It's a saint making machine for a reason. And uh, and you will you will die to yourself and uh, you will learn more about yourself. I'm a better person because of my 20 years of marriage. 
um, because I've, I've grown and learned in, in the context of family life and seeing my kids and their behaviors and things that they do. And I'm like, Hey, where'd he pick that up from? And I'm like, Oh, okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> never yeah. mind. I think I know the answer to that question. Yeah, yeah, you know, exactly. let's, 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 here's, here's the mirror. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, so I would say for people to, to, to certainly educate themselves with what the church teaches, but also to do their work within themselves to say, if my history of relationships looks a certain way, well, well, what's been that pattern? And uh, what are what are the ideals that I need to maybe navigate and, and massage a little bit? Or what is it about myself yeah. that I need to learn a little bit more on that if I'm, I'm falling too love too quickly, if I'm being overly clingy? Just taking yeah. some time to be able to reflect on that and certainly meeting with a good therapist to help you kind of unpack, not just where that may come from, but but learning those patterns from yourself so that you mm-hmm. can be better prepared and equipped for for the next relationship. Now, in terms of expectations for not marriage, but dating relationships, what are some kind of healthy attitudes or expectations that people can have going into dating relationships? And, you know, just what's the proper way to view dating? Because it's shifted so much over the past century. What do you think is kind of a healthy, balanced Catholic approach uh, for for singles when it comes to dating? What's the right attitude to have going into that? Yeah, I'd, I'd call it a, a guarded optimism, if that's the, okay. <laughs> the right way of, of articulating it. You know, because we come into and be overly naive and just be like, ah, I'm going to find every the right person and it's not going to, you know, and, and be overly happy-go-lucky about it. But and, and I wouldn't encourage that and naivete into this. But then also cynicism, you know, can creep into this. And there's always a temptation to say it's all garbage. You know, nothing's ever going to work out for me. No one's I'm never going to find anybody. And that voice can be equally loud and ringing within our ears. And so I think there's there's a there's a healthy kind of guarded optimism, you know. Mm-hmm. That if you feel and you've done your discernment and you feel that God is calling you to marriage, praise the Lord, you know, then that means like you're going to have to get out. You're going to have to date. You're going to have to do some um, exploration, you know, of, of, of learning and meeting new people. That's going to be part of that process. Um, being open to being set up from friends, those type of things. And so I would say going into just casual dating initially as as just kind of that. That's all it is. It's not you're not you're not. You're just trying to meet people, make friends, maybe, or or just get to know different people that you think, and that kind of helps just to be able to know, and 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 then it's like, okay, well, maybe I find that I've kind of connected with with one person a little bit more than the other, and then you can kind of discern whether or not you want to keep going on dates with that person. Well, then at some point you're going to discern whether or not you want to be committed and engage in a more serious relationship with that individual. And again, yeah. I'm, when I talk about casual dating, I want to be very clear. I'm not talking about casual sex in any way. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. just saying like, you know, obviously keep the boundaries in line and just going out for a cup of coffee or going for a walk around the park or meeting people or just even doing Zoom calls. I think that's the new kind of first date, you know, in, in our modern age. <laughs> How lame. <laughs> that's, that's so lame. I know, man, but you're getting <laughs> people things. online, you know, it's, it's, yeah. this is what it is, you know? Yeah. And so, uh, so it, it seems to be kind of the, the initial way of kind of connecting is a FaceTime call or or a Skype call or Zoom call or something like that. I know, but yeah. it's just what it is, man. I don't yeah, know what to but, say. but we can't we can't call that a first date. I mean, <laughs> I guess we call not. it a first meeting, a first face to face. That's it's fine, but let's first let's, conversation let's, beyond just a text thread, you know, on some app. You know, yeah, you know, and, um, and I've met super awesome Catholic married couples that have met online. That their too. first face to face was through online. So I don't want to disparage that. You know, yeah, I've always yeah, said yeah. that, like. You know, it's, I believe in online meeting, but not online dating because kind of dating has to take place face to face. But heck, if you can't find anybody, you know, within the Western hemisphere, you know, that you can connect with, you know, in your, you know, your workplace, your gym, your young adult community, Mm -hmm. I'd say take advantage of the Catholic, you know, young adult dating, not even young adult, but just dating in general. Because I mean, I meet plenty of singles in their fifties and sixties and Mm -hmm. seventies, you know, through a loss of spouse, whether it be annulment or being widowed. Um, that are now back on the dating scene for the first time in 30, 40 years. It's like, wow, the landscape's changed. Mm-hmm. And and they're frustrated because it's like, wow, like it ain't what it used these, to be. Yeah. <laughs> like these 60 year old guys are even more expectant than the 21 year old guys, right. you know, in, in terms of what they expect some, you know, 50 or 60 year old woman to be doing with them. So right. I think we got to be careful not to say, okay, this is just a millennial Gen Z kind of right. issue. This is kind of across the board, but you had mentioned in, in kind of a lot of the, the phrase discernment, discernment, discernment. So you're proposing not discerning dating as that's where discernment happens before dating, but using dating itself as a tool of discernment, right? I do. I do. I think that, listen, God is incarnational. Obviously, he's the second person in Trinity, stepped into a certain time and space and and opened the pathways for us for life. And, and I, I don't think that God 
and just even the rules of discernment in general, we talk about consolation or dens- uh, desolation, like this happens in the context of our lives. Like we have to engage with the lives that God has given to us and, uh, and, and, and be willing to, to accept certain agency. You know, certainly mm-hmm. we are in circumstances and there are circumstances that are beyond our control. If we're single in an environment, in a place where we just can't meet anybody. Okay. I get it. Or maybe we've, we've had a widow or we, our spouse has died. Obviously there are circumstances that are beyond our control. But we can't abdicate everything, you know, to that either. And mm-hmm. so, so I think when, when when I speak about the sermon, it's recognizing that that our will and our desires and our motivations, all of that is is part of what God has created us with. And so, paying attention to those things um, are are important. And uh, and and so, you may know very clearly what you're looking for, but you know, everybody's got their checklist and. And, uh, and we don't always meet people that, that hit every single one of those things on the checklist. And so there comes a point where you have to be able to, to go out, to engage, to look, to, to discern again with the Lord, praying, reflecting on what these experiences are like, not being overly scrupulous about it, not being overly, you know, kind of fixated on it, but just in general, paying attention to your heart and listening to, uh, to what's getting moved or what's not. And, uh, and doing the work there interiorly, which I think will reveal also kind of what your interests are and what you're looking for when you're actually going out and dating. Now, so when someone meets someone, they go on initial couple dates, things seem to be progressing. A lot of times there gets kind of be a, a woolly area of like, are we dating? Are we not dating? <laughs> yeah. Are we in a gray zone? Yeah. Can you p- maybe provide some clarity in terms of the different stages of a relationship and how yeah. those things progress? Yeah. So I think friendship is, is the first stage when we just want to be friends and, and connect and, you know, just having a group of friends. That's great. Wonderful. Um, and then I would say the second stage would be kind of casual dating when casual dating, you could be dating somebody that isn't a friend before, or maybe there's a person in the group that you kind of been interested with in the young adult group. And you're like, Hey, you know, I've been seeing you at you know, young Catholic professionals or some other young adult ministry. And I'm, yeah, I would love to get a cup of coffee or get a drink sometime or something, you know, that becomes kind of that first step of kind of from friendship then maybe just maybe exploring whether or not there's something more there. Casual dating becomes that. And, and that can happen. You know, you can casually date, you know, a number of people at a time, I think. Um, and that's just getting good exploring, wondering, you know, conversation, being a little more intentional with discussion. Um, but then at some point, like you said, there is kind of this gray area where, where then we move from, okay, like I've been maybe dating two or three people and, and maybe gone on a couple of dates with a few different folks over, you know, a couple of months or something, but man, there's one person that I, I kind of keep going back to. And we're, now we're having real conversation. Now there's a second date, a third date, a fourth date, a fifth date. And, uh, and then at some point the question becomes, well, what are we doing? You know, like what, yeah. what's the direction here? And I think it's a, can have that discussion to have that conversation and uh it doesn't have to be as forceful as like you know are we are we boyfriend girlfriend you know mm-hmm. but just but just at least beginning to say like hey you know like i'm 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 i'm, I'm yeah i'm really liking you i'm really liking what's going on here and uh and yeah. i'm really appreciative and I, and, I, and I hope that this being reciprocated too and i want to let you know i'm gonna i'm just stopping dating with other people and and i'm i want to you know kind of focus in on this and see see where this goes um, you know, that's my language. Anybody can use okay. their own language, you know, within that for sure. But then at that point you start getting into a more committed phase, you know, mm. uh, what we would say back in the nineties, you know, is uh, going steady with somebody. I don't, I don't know those terms don't, don't exist yeah. anymore, you know, but, but that's the term that, that we used, you know, um, yeah. you know, which meant that you're kind of in that boyfriend, girlfriend phase and, uh, and it's okay to, to reclaim those terms. I yeah. think that's part of the problem is that we have so many labels, so many options, so many, you know, names for different things that it just becomes confusing. It's like, let's just, yeah. let's just go back to kind of what works and what yeah. works is that we can call that boyfriend, girlfriend phase. And then from there, that's, that, that would be the bulk of where the sermon happens, you know, where you're really mm-hmm. kind of opening up and becoming more vulnerable with this person, becoming more intimate with them emotionally, becoming more committed to them, feeling a sense of responsibility for them, yeah. growing in that nature of wanting to take care of them. And then from there, you, you begin to discern the questions of, you know, is there compatibility or how are arguments looking like? What's family of origin stuff look like? Are we compatible with what comes to, to finances? Have we had discussions about sexual past, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the things that we do, you know, as the relationship evolves and, um, and matures. And then at some point you make a decision and say, listen, I think this is what we're supposed to do. And, and I feel God's making, making this clear that we're moving forward. And then, you know, you, you pop the question for engagement and, yeah. and, and then from their marriage. And I, I think that we, we tend to rush things and maybe sometimes we, we want engagement 
we, we move to engagement because of the fantasy or because of other things. But but if if we've discerned the dating aspect of it well, by the time we get to engagement, you know, engagement, the proposal is a yes or no question. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. will you or won't you? There's no there's no ambiguity with it. Mm-hmm. So I think by the time you get to that point, you should have had a number of these harder discussions already, yeah. um, which I know isn't always the case. I know you like you talked about those couples in San Diego. Myself, when I worked with engaged couples, you know, similarly, I'm surprised sometimes by the lack of discussions that they've had by that point. So then marriage prep should kind of provoke that to, to come out if those discussions yeah. haven't, haven't happened. But if you've been doing this well, then by the time you get to that, there, there won't be any surprises. And then you yeah. and then you move to a marriage where the commitment obviously is, is you know, to death to us part and it's permanent. And then you become a saint in that process. Nobody's yeah. perfect at the beginning. Nobody's yeah. perfect at the beginning of marriage. And that's not what we're striving for. We, we strive for perfection at the end. If, mm-hmm. if we live marriage well, if we love well, uh, we become the best versions of ourselves over the course of our lives. And so marriage just becomes the invitation, just becomes the door, op- the gateway opening uh, to that process of becoming the saint that God wants us to be. Uh, I think you provide a, r- a real neat gem there uh, in the initial comments you made in terms of, I meet a lot of, especially young adult single females that are in a predicament where they've invested a good amount of time and energy and attention in a particular guy and seem, things seem to be like they're moving, but he's not really providing any clarity. Mm-hmm. Uh, like, are we officially a thing? Like, what is our status? And she was like, well, I don't want to be the girl who has to ask him, look, are we this? Or are we that? And so I think what DTR, you're proposing, DTR. Yeah, exactly. Define the relationship. <laughs> Come on, um, man. And that puts the girls in a kind of awkward predicament. But what you're proposing is kind of a neat third way where it's not like she's putting him, you know, like on the spot like okay what's the deal what are we she's just kind of saying like look here's what i'm thinking here's what i'm feeling you know this is what i'm doing in my life and my you know intentions towards you so she's not telling him look what are your intentions what is this it's not more of like a pop quiz what are we it's more like hey this is what i'm thinking and then you just plop it out there and then watch what he says and so Hopefully that'll make him feel like this is more of a self-disclosure. It's just more her sharing with me where she's at instead of kind of cornering of like, look, when are you going to pop the question? When are we official? And so, you know, hopefully that's helpful for single women because I think you should be able to gauge. Like if, if I really like a girl and she shares with me what she's thinking and I'm on the same page, like, boom, the reciprocation is going to be there. That conversation is going to flow really naturally. But if he's not on the same board you know, and, and she unveils, like, here's my intentions. This is where I'm at. And he's not reciprocating. Well, that's going to be pretty darn clear. I mean, yep. I think she's going to feel a restlessness. And so, you know, as the relationships are kind of going, I mean, you're not an MD, but you're a PhD. MDs do kind of wellness checks, you know, like, okay, things are going good. The temperature, this, that, the gr- growth curve for kids or whatever. How about in a dating relationship? How do you know when things are actually going well? And then you can be like, and, and typically when something's healthy, you don't have to examine it. Like if I my lungs are healthy, I'm not going to a lung specialist to look at them, say things are going fine. But how can kind of a, a couple that's starting to think, move things along do their own relational wellness check to know, hey, things are progressing. What are some good signs? Yeah, I, I think one element of this that often gets overlooked is a sense of rest with the person and a sense okay. of ease in the relationship. And it's not that we talk about relationships being work for sure. You know, saints going to, you know, marriage is going to make you a saint. A- absolutely. And there's work that's involved with that. But, but I think there's a different type of work. Um, I, I don't know about you with your kids, but you know, my, my kids are, are very athletic and, and my third son particularly, you know, he, uh, plays, plays, played football and soccer, basketball, the whole bit. And he's been asking for years to play baseball. And uh, and I've been reluctant to it. It's really hot in southern Louisiana. So I didn't want to, I just self, I selfishly didn't want to play baseball because I didn't want to be out there in June, July, sweating out there. But about three years ago, we signed him up for baseball. And it was like, it's like this is his sport. I don't know how to say yeah. it. Like he's, mm-hmm. it's just natural. He like, he, he got it. He got it mm-hmm. at, a, at, a, at an easier way than he got the other sports and and he excelled with it you know a lot more than he did in the other sports that he'd been playing for years and so that's kind of the best analogy i kind of think of with this is that it's like you kind of get the sense that you you know when it kind of fits and it doesn't mean i mean he worked hard on his swing and he's worked hard on pitching and 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 fielding and doing all the things that he's supposed to do 
but you can see that there's a there's an ease with this. It's like this is his sport, and and that's just undeniable. So I think that when it when it comes to like relationships, you know, it, that kind of experience that is really an internal one. That's why we go back to that question of discernment. It's like, you know, how is this? How is conversation? How how are discussions happening? I mean, when when you go out, does it feel like it's forced, or do, do you feel like you can actually have a conversation that lasts more than an hour? You go on the first date and you go for an hour, two hours max. And it's like you wish you could just spend the whole day together, you know, mm-hmm. like those type of experiences are are possible um, yeah. when you're discussing and when you're talking about things. And even when you set your boundaries or set your your firm, your your your. Yeah. When you set your boundaries, does the other person e- express, you know, respect for those boundaries and not just respect for them and say, no, I, I, I share with them also. I share I share those as well. And I'm willing to grow, you know, into a better person because of that. So so I think that that question of of ease and and again, maybe we could talk about compatibility in that regard, um, that there's easing discussion when you talk about values, of course, or is there similarity? Uh, when it comes to to religious values, as a similarity when it comes to uh, values for your children. Now, those things you may not get at right in the right out of the gates in the first couple of dates, but but still, even that. Then the second, the other piece, then with that also is personality. Just because you're somebody's Catholic doesn't mean that there's going to be a match that's there. Mm-hmm. You can have shared value systems, but there's going to be personality issues as well that that arise. And so, do you both have some similarities, some interests? That question of friendship. But do you can you can you go on a run together, go on a hike together? Do you want to watch movies together, or yeah. do you want to go pray together? Do you want to go do chess together? What are, what are the, the the activities that you're doing together? And do you find some compatibility and share, some shared interests? in those things. So I, said, yeah. I think that at the beginning of a relationship, those are the things you're kind of looking for is that compatibility, that ease. Now, as the relationship progresses, we can certainly talk about other things uh, to be monitoring. But when it comes to that, that first kind of initial phase of things, I think that for me is 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 what's most important. Yeah, no, it, it reminds me of uh, Dr. Uh, Chapman's The Five Love Languages, you know, where he talks about like for some people, the bonding thing is doing things together, kind of shared activities mm-hmm. for other people. It's acts of service, words of affirmation, physical affection, gifts, whatever. Um, and so you got to see like, OK, do, we don't have to have necessarily have the same love language to, mm-hmm. in a sense, be compatible. But are, are they really open to doing what is my love language? You know, if it's healthy, I mean, a guy can't say my love language is physical affection, you know, so you better <laughs> you know capitulate to my desires. You know, you know, obviously in balance, but yeah. if like if his love right. language is like, let's do stuff together. And it's like, no, nope, I'm not into any of that stuff. Yep. I, you know, you got, you got to kind of look long term. OK, how is this going to play all mm-hmm. out now? Typically, uh, you know, we, we look at like the good signs and things like that. But how about the, the bad stuff? Like, how do you know when it's time to throw in the towel? Because I think a lot of people yeah. are so optimistic of just like, hey, there were so many good moments early on and then this started to show up. And a lot of times, you know, people cling on for way too long and it's just like, look, I know... I know he's a serial killer and everything, but like he's getting so much better, so you know. Hot. It was like, has, well, like Zac yeah. Efron playing in whatever Jeffrey Dahmer. Yeah. Everybody was like, Jeffrey Dahmer's hot. I was like, stop that. That's just wrong. Yeah. Can we not do that, please? Like, this yeah. is just wrong. So how do people know, you know, when it's, you know, and the, the rule that I, I try to give people is like, okay, imagine if things are like they are right now, if they just don't change 10 years from now, like, right. would you be content? And if the answer is like flat out, like, no, right. then my answer is, well, I'm, don't move this. move any deeper into this relationship. You know, you know, really set some guidelines of like, okay, how fast do things need to get going in the right direction before you realize, okay, I'm investing in something that really might not ever pan out. Because if you know, if it's just you know personality discrepancies or like, I mean, it could be severe mental health issues. Because like, if someone's got a severe enough personality disorder, I mean, this could impact not just a a stressful life together, but could, you know, impact the validity of the the marital bond itself, depending on how serious this is. So how can a single person who's kind of sitting on the fence or even an engaged couple, because I had a uh, Emily Wilson on the podcast a while back, and she talked about the fact that she's never met an engaged couple that regretted calling off the engagement. At least the person who called it off didn't regret it. Right. Um, so how can a person know Okay, is this is this just human, you know, challenges that any couple is going to go through, and they've just got to work through it together as a team, and we're going to see progress, and we're going to move past this, or am I really chasing after a dream, or I'm am I chasing after a nightmare here? Yeah. So in the beginning stages, again, back to the dating phase of things, like I would say, if there isn't that compatibility and conversation isn't easy, or maybe there's real personality differences and quirks that like. 
or maybe the person's just rude. You know, you go out to eat and and they're t- bad mouthing, you know, the 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 waitress or you know mm-hmm. things that or they don't know how to open the door for you. They're not sure. Things things of that. Even when people are trying to be on their best behavior and they're not, I would say right out of the gates, that's probably not somebody that that's going to be good for you. Mm-hmm. But when we get into this kind of more serious dating phase and moving towards engagement, what are the things that we should be looking for? Well, I, I would say. Um, Certainly, as you talked about with mental health issues, you know, you can absolutely marry somebody, you know, with a mental health concern if they have depression, anxiety or something of that nature. The question is, to what degree are they aware of it and to what degree are they willing to get work, you know, to do the work for themselves, to go to counseling? And sometimes the relationship itself becomes the catalyst to encourage people to go to counseling. I've seen that also with with men who struggle with pornography that like, yes, ideally it'd be best for, for guys to be clean going into this. That isn't always the case. And sometimes the relationship in a healthy way becomes the thing, not to idolize the relationship, becomes the thing that that bucks them up and says, there's another person here. You know, this isn't just my Mm -hmm. sin anymore. This is affecting somebody else. Now it's time for me to really do the work to get myself better. And those things end end up happening. So if you can identify what the concerns are, whether there's conflicts that you have, whether it is issues of, of this nature, whether it's an addiction or mental health issues, you can identify what the problems are. But then you bring them up and address them in the context of the of a, you know in the relationship and in a, in a conversation and do you see improvement you know give it a couple months and do you see that in a couple months there's been real change or there's mm-hmm. been real motivation to go get help or three months or six months max is what i would say give it some time to give that person you've brought up the complaint you've brought up the issue you've brought up the things that you see give the person an opportunity to be able to respond to them and if you see after a couple months that there's no change, they're not getting better, they're not going to the group, they're not going to counseling, they're not doing the things that they're supposed to be doing to get themselves healthy, not just for the relationship, but for themselves, you're seeing that there isn't any marked improvement there. Well, then, OK, I think that's that's a way of being able to discern whether or not uh, this is somebody who you'll be ready to, to move forward with. Yeah. And so and then even when it comes to the relationship dynamics themselves, if there's a lot of arguments, I would say. Um, because sometimes relationships, sometimes people are just two spitfires, you know, man, they're just mm-hmm. kind of going at it. And sometimes that's just a personality. OK, I get it. But but by and large, if we we get into conflict with with somebody that we're in a relationship with, the things that we want to assess is the frequency of those disagreements, the duration of those disagreements, how long they last, but then also like how in the intensity of them as well. So frequency, how often, how long does it last? How long does it last for us to rebound? What is what is making up look like on the other side of that was conversations look like on the other side of that but then also just h- how long it takes for you to get to that point and the mm-hmm. intensity of it i mean if it, if if it, the intensity continues to increase and all you're finding is that you're cursing more you're you're cussing each other out and it's getting more and more then those are again moments within yourself to say listen i don't i don't know if this is if this is what's healthy for you in the long run um yeah. so again you can bring up those issues bring your concerns whatever they might be Give an opportunity for change to happen. If in a reasonable amount of time you're not seeing change occur, um, then then you kind of have your answers. Yeah, yeah. But I think the temptation during these difficult moments for singles is to look at the past or look at the future and mm-hmm. pay more attention to that. Like, oh, but he used to be so sweet or she used to be right. so wonderful or how wonderful things could be in the future if this thing just gets solved. And you start living in those places to avoid looking at the present moment. Mm-hmm. And like, does this person really exercise extreme ownership of this issue? And if not, am I just choosing to be confused? Like, mm-hmm. oh, I don't know what to do. I don't want to do. Like sometimes we're retreating into a place of confusion because the the, the plain fact of what's in front of your face is just like that's scary so i'm gonna go to live in the past or the future and then just claim i'm confused right now instead of making tough decisions because if we don't make tough decisions if we don't have that capacity then our life is going to be a heck of a lot more tough and so uh, how can young adults married couples get in touch with you the work that you're doing to learn more because a lot of people are like hey this struck a chord. I want to go deeper in these issues. I want to have a healthy relationship or I want to learn more about this stuff. Where can people get in touch with the good work you're doing? Yeah, sure. The easiest ways to find me on social media, on Instagram, Facebook at Dr. Mario Sacasa or LinkedIn at Dr. Mario Sacasa. Um, can you spell that out? Yep. Uh, D-R-M-A-R-I-O-S-A-C-A-S-A at Dr. Mm-hmm. Mario Sacasa. Um, there's not many Mario Sacasas in the world, so yeah. people will find me pretty quickly. Well, that's a good um, thing. So certainly check out, you know, the work that we're doing there. Um, you can listen to my podcast, Always Hope, um, which I actually am interviewing Kristalina uh, tomorrow on the show. So I'm looking forward to that conversation, your, your beautiful bride. Okay. And uh, I have over four years 
over 115 episodes available for people that many of them dive into relationship questions, but also general mental health stuff and, uh, and, and, uh, spiritual discernment questions as well. I have experts on the show regularly to talk about all these things. And if people are interested specifically in, in dating advice that I offer, I do have a course called dating well, um, that you can find that at faith and and you can purchase and enroll in the course and it's 19 video lessons, self-guided course, uh, that goes through many of the things I spoke about right now, but, but even more into greater detail, um, about the stages of relationship and how to be able to monitor and navigate the, the complexities of the dating scene. So I would say, yeah, hit me up on Instagram. Instagram or follow me, uh, head over to faithandmarriage.org to check out the podcast or uh, check out Dating Well. So Terrific. that's the way to get hold of me. And I'll yeah. put all those links in the show notes uh, sure. for anybody watching on whether it be YouTube or whatever. You can just click those links. Also put the links for uh, lentformen.com slash Jason and canopy.us slash Jason in terms of getting in touch with the Lent program if you're a guy you want to do that or the internet safety stuff with Canopy. But Dr. Mario, thank you for coming on the program today. Keep up the wonderful work appreciate it. You too, man. Thank you.